I'm a feminist, but I'm often disappointed the clothes I order online don't look on me the way they look on the woman on the website and feel resentful and send them back, but then feel good because I get a refund, which feels like free money. Help me. <laughs> help me. Help me. I've got a, it's a circular loop crisis. I'm sure it's bad for the environment to, you know. And I don't, I actually don't order too many clothes. I order a few good quality things that I really am going to wear a lot. If you look at my Instagram, you'll see me wearing the same things again and again and again in a loop that I've worn for 10, 15 years. So as far as the environments are concerned, the environment's concerned, I get a letter from the environment every week going, well done. (laughs) However... That was one of those things where I just sat back and let you speak yourself into a hole. Yeah. (laughs) It's a lovely warm hole. (laughs) However, 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 one of the reasons you'll see me wearing the same thing for 15 years is I send a lot of the stuff back because I think that doesn't look as good as me it does on that model. What, after 15 years? Keep the tags in. No. Keep the tags in. They'll probably take this back. Listen, (laughs) I send it back quickly to get the free money. I'm a feminist, but I prefer going to men's football because there's never a queue for the toilets. And I like how toxic it gets. It feels like a safe space for me to do screaming. <laughs> do you do screaming? Oh, so much screaming. Going to the football is like shouting at the sea. It's like, it's like you can just scream because everyone else is screaming around you so loudly. And also you can say the worst shit and you know that the person next to you has said something worse the week before. It's, just, it's, it's honestly one of the most judgment-free zones I've ever been to. That's interesting. Yeah. There's no female zone as judgment-free as the men's football is there. Because women, we've been trained to judge ourselves and each other. Yeah. And a lot of the guys who go to the football have never thought about judging themselves. Yeah, it's true. It's not occurred to them once in their whole life to judge themselves. No one suggested it, and they've not picked up on it. And also, yeah, like... If I was if I was like around those blokes in any other context, I'd be scared for my life. But when you put on the same colour scarf as them, they're just like, you're all right. You all right? I'm a feminist, but what are boundaries? <laughs> Struggle with them. I'm never sure what they are, really. Other people seem to talk about them a lot. If people ask me for stuff, I tend to want to give it to them. And I struggle with the concept of not being lovely to people if they're yeah. wanting stuff. And I know I've got a lot better because I've done some psychedelics. <laughs> legally, legally, in countries where it's legal with a shaman. But... Don't just do it. Don't just do it on your own. Don't, please don't. I beg you not to. But Definitely I have... do it on your own. It's really fun. No, don't do it. Only in a country where it's legal with a registered shaman. No. I don't know if they're registered, actually. I don't know if shamans register. <laughs> but a trustworthy one, and you've got to get the... You, you, ha, you must be recommended. This is very important for me, I think, to say that. It has helped me a bit. But if I relapse, it's generally in boundaries. And boundaries with people and biscuits. Where do you think it comes from? Is it like a uh, desire to be liked? Uh, no, it comes from the fact that my birth mother had to give me away. So I was alone for the first 10 days and did not develop. Uh, I was just, I mean, I wasn't completely alone. I wasn't left in a bush. I was in a <laughs> hospital. A nurse would come by and feed me, but I didn't have anybody attaching yeah, okay. for the first 10 days. So what I learned was outside the womb, you're on your own. And That's you have to crazy. do jazz hands to flag down a passing nurse to get some milk. And when the milk uh-huh. comes, drink all the fucking milk because it might not come again. No one's going to be fussing over you going, do you want a bit more? Do you want a bit more? She's not latching. You like, adopt a baby's latch. Okay. You latch to the teat. And it's a, always a rubber teat, of course. Um, so uh, I guess in their exceptional circumstances otherwise. But yeah. So I suspect it's a combination of that and being in a shunning cult. Those two things together have meant that my boundaries are not as expert at others that's the most information i've ever received from one question <laughs> i mean i wouldn't advise that was incredible it. yeah it's probably that but no i mean i mean actually it was not till you asked this was like therapy that i really probably put my so you, you just discovered that just then i mean that why my boundaries are particularly off i mean i know i know i knew those things about myself yeah I, I wasn't having that much of a breakthrough just like <laughs> fuck i've never thought of this before but i'm really pleased to hear that Thank you. Should I do another one? Yeah. I'm a feminist, I'm but... I'm say no, am I? <laughs> got my boundaries. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I'm a feminist, but when I was a teenager, a group of us used to stay over our mate Stephen's house, and me and Martha, who were the only two girls, we got to stay in the massive good room with beds in because Stephen's dad said we had wombs. <laughs> and... And every, wombs? Yeah. And every time I walked past him, I'd rub my womb and go, oh... 
Or that does smart, so that we keep getting the good bed. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I am now taking joy at the idea of Chloe Pets as a child with a smarting womb. I'm taking joy in the idea. <laughs> Posing, having a smarting womb. Did it make him laugh? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was pretty funny. He used to take me and Martha into his room and play us for Rachmaninoff. Oh, I was... Oh, God. <laughs> I, I don't... Oh, my God. Sorry, I'm, I'm accidentally, like, bringing real undercurrents of pedo vibes yeah. to that. I'm a it feminist. Was, I just think... I, I just feel like the composer shouldn't have Rack in his name. Do you know what I mean? Rack. <laughs> you know, like Nice Rack. Yeah, Nice yeah, Rack. Nice we rack. had a... Last time I was on, we had a whole thing about Nice Rack. Do you remember that? No. You thought I said nice rack. Oh, like, yes. you thought I came out and went, hi, Deborah, nice rack. And oh, I was like... Right. What did you say? Hello? Well, how are you? Gosh, well, that's on me then. And you went... <laughs> did you just say nice rack? I was like, absolutely not. I wouldn't come on to the guilty feminist for the first time. I'd just be like, lovely tits there, actually. <laughs> I'd be thrilled if you did. I think... The thing is, I had a big... I'm a feminist, but I had a big discussion with Deanne Smith. You know the comedian, Deanne Smith. So funny. So, so funny so funny so lovely and they had a whole routine that I saw them do on stage about nice ra a sick rack sick Deanne rack. Smith referred to themselves as having a sick rack and Deanne said to me you've got a sick rack too and I said I really don't I said my rack has a mild cold at best <laughs> it's not going to get signed <laughs> off work for being properly... It will not be hospitalised, not with the state of the NHS. <laughs> it would just be told to go home and have an aspirin. And, Let's have a lie down. This I is not... It's rack. It's fine. It's... No, it's okay. Okay. It, for the size of my body... Yeah. It is not... If you're listening... I mean, you don't know the size of my body. I'm just five foot nine and I've got broad shoulders. Yeah. And it's not... It's not a sick rack for the size of my body. It's just a rack... Yeah. It's like a sports rack. For those fun. listening at home, I am now touching the rack and um, <laughs> I can confirm that it's very good. <laughs> it's okay. It's not, I could have bigger boobs. Do you know what? I've never wanted them though because I just think they're a bit, of, they could be a bit of an inconvenience. I've always thought my boobs are a perfectly good example of the genre. Then I think that's a sick rack. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just not what people are imagining when they hear sick racks. It's, what do you think they're imagining? A, bit big. A large, busty, <laughs> handfuls, perky, whirr. And I've got just two breasts that are medium me for the size of my body. They're, not, they're neither large nor small. They're just, they just are... You know, if I wear something like this, I don't get, like, a massive cleavage or anything. I just get, you know, I have to hoist them up into a bra to get them to point in the right direction. You know, it, they're fine. They're fine. They're not... They're neither perky nor floppy. They're just... They are. They just are. This is the most that I've ever tried to make eye contact with a person in all my life. <laughs> look, please feel free to look at them. They're just... They're just what they are. Have you... Do, have you met Helen Bauer? Yeah. Do you know that she can touch your she's an amazing comedian if you don't know but you probably do she can just hold your tits and tell you what your bra size is she has done that to it's me what it's fucking she's done that to me really in accurate. a ladies loo so accurate like she's got a hit rate to the point that she did it to someone and said what the bra size was and the person said no that's wrong and every woman in the vicinity turned around and went Helen is correct you need to go and get another bra size fitting wow. yeah. she powerful. told me mine was wrong but everyone you go to tells it it's wrong you go to you know Rigby and Pedder or whatever they're meant to be the experts which I did once and you get that and then it's wrong and you Marks and Spencer where they measure that it's wrong I don't know Helen every... Bauer is the definitive movie. I think I need to so. brush up with her but I get mine from Honey Love because they're not underwired and they're you know they're just very comfortable mm. and I think I might be at a point where I'm like I'm not trying to have a sick rack I'm just having just a, a rack a, just a rack will do I wear a binder so I don't want a rack at all the end is it my go or yours? I think it's definitely yours. Is it? What was your one about your rack? We focused on my tits for long enough. Right, yeah, yeah. Deanne Smith and my sick rack. Ah, yes, yes. I'm a feminist, uh, but I can't do stand-up when I'm on my period because I think everyone hates me then become verbally aggressive. 
Brackets at men. <laughs> I think that's really self-knowledge. Yeah. But don't go out and do a new joke if you're on your period because the audience might not laugh because it's just, you know, it's just you and you need to find a punchline yet and you will take that incredibly personally and go home it's and It's so weep. overwhelming. It's yeah. to the point where I think that, like, people that menstruate that do the Edinburgh Fringe should get, like... You know, like, how people with dyslexia or something get a laptop an extra time on an exam? Mm. I think I should get a laptop and an extra time to write my Edinburgh Fringe show. Because it's like, you know, what, if I'm menstruating for five, four or five days a month, yep. times up by 11, yep. you, that's quite a high number. Yeah. <laughs> 44. Yep. Well, 55, 44 or 55. Five, yeah, yeah. If it's five days a month. That's out. That, those are out of the question. Right, so I should get those added on. <laughs> what do you think? So what, you have to do Edinburgh 55 days late? Yes. Everyone else will be gone. Yeah, it's staggered. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else's post is down, mine's the only one that's left up. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd sell well, <laughs> except there'd be no audience there. Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents the Guilty Marvellous with me, Little Cousins Five, guest guys, fellow pets, and our very special guest, this is the Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Chloe Petz, and we're talking about how to win people over. Um, now, Chloe, you know how to win people over because we've seen you in a previous show that may or may not have been recorded on this very same evening you can get free stuff from audience members just by bonding with them live on stage. We've seen this happen. Yeah, I don't know whether it's bonding or sort of... Um, intimidating. Yes, intimidating. I have a natural aggression to yeah. me. You don't. You're very charismatic and charming on stage. I was saying that to you the other night. I saw you do a, a, TV, a TV taping, <laughs> and I felt like you brought the gig to us. You didn't say, oh, you come to me. You brought the gig to us. But with strong leadership, I'd vote for you. Thank you. Like if you Thank if you, you ran as an MP and I was in your borough. Yeah, I think I'd make a good leader actually. I think I think I'd be fair, um, but also slightly dictatorial. <laughs> I think you'd need a very well cut suit to win that election. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you're listening at home, there's a tailor in the audience. Oh, well, the tailor's gone. Gee. Oh, it's oh. Gone. <laughs> gone to the back, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> She's moved. She's moved. Okay. Gee, we need to get your... Where do you... Who do you work with? Oh! Can I... Eden I'll message you on Instagram. Eden Ravenscroft uh, used to make all the cap and gown type stuff when I was at university. I, I was told you had to go there because we had to get a gown and we had to get a cap and we had to get um, something called subfusk, which was how... We, you, you still have to dress like this for Oxford exams, where you had to have a white shirt and a black ribbon... And black trousers. So you just had to go in and and, um, and so someone said you, you should probably get a college scarf because you know you're a fresher and you know you want to identify with your college. So I went in and I said, um, you know, I need this and this and this. And the chap would, he was honestly like out of a Dickens book. And I said, Can I have a college scarf for Harris Manchester? And he said, crested or uncrested. <laughs> and I said, um, uncrested. He said, very good. We keep the crested because the Americans like them. <laughs> and then I needed to get a bow tie for a man. And I said, uh, can I get a bow tie? And he said, a ready-made bow tie or a bow tie you tie yourself. And I said, oh, one you tie yourself. He said, very good. <laughs> we keep the ready-mades because the Americans like them. <laughs> It became a rolling theme um, that he was just so disdainful of a section of his own shop that he had to cater to the Americans because he needed to make the money. But everything was a test. And if I'd said crested, he presumably just would have gone and got me one and given it to me with a disdainful, haughty look, and I never would have known why. But I What knew. is crested and uncrested? How did you know what to say? Oxford College scarves have, like, you know, like red, blue yellow or you know red white white or whatever yeah and you're meant to know which college someone's from just from the colors right if it's got Morden college on it which is a crest which says Morden college oh, I you're see. american because you don't know and you think it's cool to have the logo on yeah 
And you want when you go home, you want people to know you were at Morden for a year on your junior sure, year abroad sure. or whatever. And it's just it's it's that sort of secret club feeling, okay. which is a gentleman knows. A gentleman right. doesn't need to be told. It's okay. that kind of feeling. I've got you. It's snooty. Yeah. But he was advertising snooty and I was enjoying it. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't being anyone he wasn't, and he wasn't pretending he wasn't being snooty. And you know, a bit of an American bashing, we love it, you know? And <laughs> to be fair to them, they are thick, God bless them. <laughs> and if you are American and you're in, you're the my, lovely ones. My point still stands. No, no it doesn't. <laughs> Even Ravenscroft G, do you have things like that where Americans come in and ask for different things or, or different sorts of people cast for different things? That, uh, they ask about what is the etiquette. So they ask questions like, what should I, if I'm going to this event, what should I wear? Mm. And you have to explain to them in Britain this and that. Do they ever ask you for a tuxedo and do you say, we don't say that here, we say black tie or a dinner jacket? You don't correct them. Nice you, person, that. Do you judge them, G? You do. <laughs> it's, it's also so funny that G moved to the back so that we went towards her and now we're speaking to her and, but she has to speak louder. <laughs> G, G, G is the star of this show and always will be, as yeah, far as I'm concerned. She's carrying it. Are you, are you Eden Ravenscroft in the city? Chancery Lane. Oh, my God, so you get all of the barristers and... and... I've followed you. Have you? Yeah, look, there's you. Found her. How did you find her? Just <laughs> um, from G. No, no, I found Eden Ravenscroft, and then you go into who's following them. She's only then... just said that though. <laughs> <laughs> My God. <laughs> and then you search oh, G, and I'm stalk are you? Yeah. Oh, My God. Anyway, are you going to DM her? Uh, nah, she can DM me. Wow, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be weird. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I understand. Gee, what Chloe's saying there is, is uh, slide into my DM stream. Sl- slide in with a picture of a lovely dinner jacket if, you, if it, if you fancy. Um, all right, we need to move on to the show. Um, uh, right, so I'm going to say. Uh, Shall I bring him to climax again? Yeah. If that's okay. I mean, I know, I know it has to happen four times, but otherwise in the podcast you won't hear yourself cheering and whooping. And oh, yeah. Someone stuff. do like a really weird cheer and then you'll be able to hear yourself. That's a really good idea. It's a bit like one, um, one dick pic only though, isn't it? If everyone's going to go for that now. Yeah, but they might do like... Like, a, someone's... Like, a, like I'm doing a show at Regis Park Zoo. <laughs> Cluck like a chicken, someone bark like a dog. All right. Let's see Whatever you want. You freestyle. You freestyle, right. okay. All righty. Live from King's Place Theatre in London. Oh, sorry. I shouldn't have said theatre. It's just live from King's Place. Sorry. Sorry. Got the name wrong. <laughs> I can't even do the name of a venue right. It's, hard. it's a real problem. That's also not the bit where they climax. No, it's just the bit where they, they meant to come in after London. and I, Oh, London. I got it wrong. Right, really? uh, but do you, how do you win people over? Do you, do you, are you conscious of that on stage that you're very likeable? Um... Well, I, I don't think it's something that I'm, like, doing on purpose. I don't think I come out with, sort of, like, a likability manifesto. But I think it's... Um, <laughs> it's well, it's difficult. It, as, as sort of an English person who, who's learned never to take a compliment or say anything nice about yourself, I'm finding this, this question difficult to answer. And okay. I suppose that's what makes me really likeable. Um, <laughs> um, but, no, I think... I think um, yeah, I, I think maybe it's uh, it's a quality of that my family have. All of the Petsies are very good at talking to whoever, you know, prince, pauper, whatever. I think we just talk to everyone in exactly the same way. Prince, pauper. That's a very prince interesting... Prince or pauper or whoever. Yeah, a very interesting dichotomy there. Yeah. Have you met a prince? Like, have you ever chatted up Prince William at the Royal Variety or anything like that? No, never done that. I know, I don't think I would. Actually, yeah, maybe paupers are the only people that I would actually speak to. <laughs> okay, so if there was a prince, I'd be like, no thanks. Okay. I don't think would I you, curtsy, you know. Can I just suggest that you don't call anyone a pauper <laughs> if you meet them and decide that they are? Because I think that is Im- immediately off-putting. <laughs> I, think, I don't think that's the charismatic <laughs> stance that you believe you have. I okay. think... I think the very fact that you're thinking about winning over princes and paupers <laughs> makes you less likable than you come across as. Okay, okay. You've lost. Like, I, you're so likable and you've lost about 25 likability. Oh, points. no. Okay. You, oh, I know, so I'm imagining you now sort of sidling up to Prince Harry and go on a, at a bus stop. 
Well, I don't know why I think he's at a bus stop, but you know, he's, he's, a, he's trying to be a man of the people now. Yeah. You're sidling up to Prince Harry and you're like, has a. Well, Spike is his nickname, isn't it? He likes to be called Spike, I heard. Does he? Yeah, that's his nickname. Well, uh, no, but I, I don't think I'm sort of. Um, it's not like I'm trying to win over the people. I think it's just you just speak to everyone like the same. Do you know what I mean? Um, and and that that uh, that place of just I'll be Chloe Petz no matter who you are. Yeah, I'm not changing for you. Please don't change for me. Maybe yeah. that's what it is. Just be yourself, you know. And have you ever won anyone over on an issue like at school or like uh, have you have you campaigned for anything? Have you tried to get people on side? Have you? Book, yeah, you sort of I went to all, people into petitioning. Yeah, I went to an all girls school so that we were having at least a weekly petition. <laughs> That's what it is going to a girls school is we have to wear teachers tell us we have to wear our skirts above the knee. We're having a petition. Above yeah. the knee? Uh, below the knee. That, I'm, that's a creep. That's a fucking that's pervy a cre- school. That's I went a creepy to. headmaster. Oh. Come on, we've got the measuring stick out. Yeah. Kneel down. No, shorter. Another inch up, please, Miss Pets. We yeah. need to see a flash of knickers <laughs> here at Centrinians. Um, um, imagine me at Centrinians. I'd like to imagine me at Centrinians, actually. <laughs> no, no. Nope, that's weird. When I, when I would have been age appropriate. Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you should go window shopping at Centrinians now, but if you were 15 or 16, you would have had a good time. Oh, I, I would have had a fantastic time. <laughs> Jolly hockey sticks. Very jolly. Okay, <laughs> sexy thing. Stop, you're making me blush. Move on. <laughs> okay. Yes, good. Can you remember any of the petitions? No, honestly, honestly, no. We um, we had to do five A-levels. Oh, my God. And I thought that that was exclusionary. Yes. Because it meant that some of the girls who had been at the school since year seven felt they had to leave to go to a school where they could do three A-levels or four A-levels. I thought that was unfair that they had to go elsewhere. And I think their needs should have been catered to. So I was head girl. Thank you. Were you? Yeah, of course I fucking was. <laughs> I've got the biggest head girl energy there's ever been. And the thing, there's, there's quite a few head girls on the comedy circuit and we've all found each other. And you just, we just go, were you one? And they go, yeah. Wow. Who else was head girl on the circuit? I think um, uh, Maisie. Adam. Yes. I think she yeah, was yeah. head girl. Margaret Cabon Smith certainly should have been head girl, and I think she told me there wasn't head girl at her school, or she definitely would have been. Yeah, she's like, I would have been, but we didn't have that. Um, disappointingly, uh, who else was head girl? I honestly can't remember now. I think Catherine Bohart has, like, I got a bit confused with her because I was like, mm, I'm sensing something here, but you're not quite head girl, and I was like, you're prefect that does all of the admin. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just give us a cheer if, this, if you were a head girl. Yeah, knew it. there's always there's always a few in a guilty feminist audience. And then um, who who was so you were the charismatic figurehead, and then who were the prefects? <laughs> yeah, you're the fucking dog wow. dogs bodies that made us look good. Uh, just give us a cheer if you were a slacker. A what? A slacker. A slacker. Like someone who was not in for any, you know, like just up, down around the back of the bike sheds with a cigarette. Yeah. There's a couple of Rizzo's, uh, but not many. More more prefects than Rizzo's in a guilty feminist audience. That's fascinating. <laughs> I've never done that before, but I'm going to do that at every show from now on. I'm going to get yeah, some proper good, stats. On. Yeah, well, I might write some stand-up about being a head girl now. So oh, You have to do a show called Head Girl. Do an Edinburgh out called Head Girl. That's going to make a very interesting poster, particularly <laughs> particularly as people like to go around drawing willies on them. Yeah, of course, the, if you've got the word head in the poster. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah you're really asking for it. <laughs> you're not You're not asking for it. No matter what you wear or do, you're not asking for it. Deborah Fry's swipe. I'm a feminist, but I love victim blaming. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Jesus. Oh, my God. I just meant, like, if you... Oh, no, you're not asking... We heard what... We all heard what you said. Oh, no. (laughs) Tom, keep that in the edit. Oh, God. We need to know what... We need to know what she's really like. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. (laughs) Are you ready to see some stand-up comedy? (laughs) Then, please, welcome to the stage the incredible Chloe Pets. Hello, still me. So as, as I've mentioned, I absolutely love football. I think it's the best thing in the whole world. Does anyone else here like football? It's fantastic. Who do you support? Man United. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. It's terrible for you it at the moment. So but things, things are going to get better, I promise. Um, do, so well, the issue that I have with football is that I get a lot of sexism. Do you, do you get that when you sort of access space? And it's, it's difficult because there's like a certain type of man that doesn't seem to think that I can know as much about football as he can. It's like he doesn't think I've got time to both watch Match of the Day and buy sanitary products. Um, <laughs> but the key thing about that is you stockpile in the summer. <laughs> so you're ready for when the season starts in the winter. A little tip for the Man United fan down there. Um, but I love, I love going to football because, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, it's a place where I can be really angry and sort of express my anger. And my favourite thing to do at the football is absolutely hate. I love it. I love it so much. I think, I think my favourite bit of going to the football is when you, you get outside the stadium and you walk past all of the away fans and you get this like fuzzy feeling in your chest. It bubbles up inside you and you feel all light and airy and you look at them and you think, I fucking hate you so much. <laughs> and then my liberal lefty self will be like, isn't it a shame that the only reason I hate these people is because they're wearing a different colour shirt to the one that I'm wearing and the fact that they're clearly massive bell ends. Um, <laughs> But I try not to get too raging at myself because all sport is predicated on the concept of hate. You have to hate someone in sports. That's the rules. So in football, uh, it's away fans, maybe the referee. Uh, in rugby, it's Australians. Um, uh, golf, it's the poor. Um, <laughs> but I'm a Crystal Palace fan. I love going to Crystal Palace. And um, I feel like I've sort of... Um, I, I've, I've been fully embraced by the lad culture of Crystal Palace to an extent. Because um, basically, I'm a season ticket holder at Palace, which means I sit in the same spot every week. And it means I've got the same people that sit around me. So I've got three neighbours. I've got a guy that sits in front of me, a guy that sits next to me, a guy that sits behind me. Now, what would be a comedically and narratively expedient thing to do is give you a pithy description of each of these blokes. You can get them in your head. I move on from my story. Unfortunately, I can't do that because they're just a different version of the same man in small, medium and large... <laughs> Do you ever look at a bloke and think, all oh, gout? Oh. <laughs> That's these three. I've named them the Allens. Um, and me and the Allens, we didn't get on very well initially because when I'd get to the game, they'd always like, they'd be there really chatting to each other, chatting to each other about man shit. You, we all know man shit. Um, like, like motorways, you fucking up. Your eyes lit up then. Wow. <laughs> wow, your eyes lit up. Um, service stations, you love a service. What's your favourite service station, sir? You've got to have one. Come on, you're not into man shit. Man in the sort of uh, the shirt. You, you smack of having a favourite service station. If you're, I know what you're gonna say. Fleet. You fucking dumb, mate. That is where Helen Bowers from, actually. Fleet service station. So if you want to get your bra tested, then um, go there. Uh, it's obviously T Bay or Gloucester. You're not dumb. Come on, mate. T Bay or Gloucester is fantastic. Anyway, thank you. So. Motorways, service stations, uh, spirit levels. That's what men like to talk about. So I get there and the Allens, they're all having this, this conversation about man shit and I try and get involved in it because I like talking about man shit too. Every time I try and speak to them, they stop, look at me like I've forgotten to stop all my sanitary products and I'm just free bleeding, okay? <laughs> I never am, I'm very diligent. <laughs> So this kept going on until one day I was at a game, uh, Crystal Palace were having a particularly difficult day, as was I. We went 2-0 down and Sellers part where we played fell silent and I sort of slumped down into my chair. And then I, what I felt happen was like the blood started boiling in my feet and it sort of pushed up through my body and kind of propelled me up out of my seat. And at that moment I became gammon incarnate. <laughs> And I unleashed this verbal tirade against the fans, the players, the playing staff of Watford Football Club, who we were playing at that time, culminating in me saying some very unkind things about their mascot, Harry the Hornet. Um, <laughs> honestly, the most angry I've ever been at a man-sized wasp. Um, <laughs> I also spent quite a long time doing the wanker sign, like I really got into it. I, I, I fucking love doing that. When was the last time you did um, the wanker sign, Man United fan? Um, probably a rugby match rather than a football match. Really? When was that? You need to up the frequency, okay? <laughs> we really need to be up in the wanker signs. Very cathartic experience, very free. In fact, on the way out, we're all going to do a group wanking, okay? <laughs> and if you haven't done for a, one for a while and you're worried about your technique, then just look at the football fans. We've got you covered. You see the way I'm really putting my full body into it? You know? <laughs> okay, just have a look around and we'll look after you. So anyway, I managed to um, put my, my wanker sign away and I sort of slumped back down into the chair. Um, Celeste Park was still silent I was feeling a bit sheepish and uh, Alan number two sort of turned and looked at me and I think oh god what have I done and then um, a couple moments later he sort of jabs me in the ribs and I think here we go and he turns to me and he goes the M1 was a nightmare 
I was like, yeah, babes, there was an accident on Junction 5. <laughs> I've been Chloe. You've been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Chloe Pets, everybody! Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. We would love you to come and see us at the Soho Theatre at 9.30pm on the 1st of November, the 2nd of November, the 3rd of November and the 4th of November. We're going to be doing some great, funny shows there. Australian dates are coming soon. Check guiltyfeminist.com for details. And if you could rate, review and follow us wherever you get your podcasts, that would be incredible. For ad-free episodes, go to patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist or you can subscribe via Acast or Apple Podcasts. And now back to the podcast. Our guest today is a mother and clean air advocate who has been campaigning tirelessly to raise public awareness about the health impacts of air pollution. She has been named on the Women's Hour Power List 2020, British Vogue's 25 in 2021, and the Times Green Power List 2021. She is also the founder of the Ella Roberta Foundation and in December was awarded a CBE. Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage the incredible Rosamond Adu Kissy Debra. Um, Rosamond, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Now, clean air, which is quite an issue at the moment, especially with Rishi Sunak rolling back promises because we all prefer dirty, polluted air, apparently. That's a Tory vote winner. Um, uh, you know, you are at the heart of this campaign. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to become such a prominent advocate for clean air. Yeah, sure. I mean, he's desperate for your votes. I mean... Well, he's not getting it. He, can, <laughs> he, can, he will never get it. I don't care if he turns around and says clean air for everyone and open borders. And No, I won't believe him because I know conservatives. And no, he will never get my vote. Sure. Um... <laughs> Tell us about clean air. Well, I... Um... <laughs> By trade, I'm actually a teacher, so I was laughing at your jokes about head head girl. So I was <laughs> head of year and head of sixth form, minding my own business as you do. Um, and until my eldest daughter um, suddenly, out of the blue, became ill in 2010. So it's actually been 30... I've been on this journey actually for 13 years now. Um, and what... Actually, it was actually during October half term. Mm. Yeah, so I can actually remember the exact date, the 24th of October 2010, which is coming up actually. So she got initially what we assumed was a cold and yeah, no one's going to freak out about a cold, are they? Especially when you've had twins as well. I mean, a cold is nothing. And unfortunately, um, for me and them, it actually turned into one of the worst cases ever of asthma ever recorded in this country. So okay. that's how severe it was. She became ill in October, and by December, she'd, she had already been in her first coma. So we actually didn't have long to get used to her being ill. And then within 28 months from when she first got ill, she passed away in 2013. And this is the 10th anniversary, actually. Oh, my God. How old was she when she passed away? She was nine, and it was three weeks exactly after her birthday. Oh, my God. That so she so just weird. made it to um, nine, nine, not nine years old, yeah. So that's how I got involved. And when she was alive, actually, the difficulty of managing her, so I had to resuscitate her numerous times at at home the idea was to at least 
keep her breathing until I managed to get her um, into hospital. She, yeah, she, she was very, very, very difficult to actually manage. But the issue was then, we actually didn't know what her triggers were. It was really odd. So she'd had numerous tests for like epilepsy, cystic fibroid, all sorts of things. And we never got to the bottom of it when she was alive. I think that's probably my only regret, that we never got to tell her why she was actually ill. Mm. And was it actually definitely pollution that was the contribute was the was the main factor? Sadly, yes. Um, her brilliant lawyer, um, Jocelyn Coburn. So Jocelyn was the same lawyer in the Stephen Lawrence case, and she's an incredibly smart woman. And <laughs> I remember when I first met her going into her office um, because she was looking for people that had been impacted by air pollution. And I'd had people in my neighborhood say, mm, we think it might be, you know, those kind of weird people who monitor air pollution at that time. That's what I thought. And she was looking for people who had been affected by air pollution. And I remember going to see her in her office, like this gigantic building in Houston. And I sort of got there and I said, well, number one, I haven't got any money. Number two, I'm not selling my house. And then I also think that I've got the story which she wanted. And what Jocelyn actually did is every... Every time Ella went into hospital, those of you who have gone into hospital, they actually register you. So she got all the dates that she'd been in hospital. Then she got the pollution from the monitors on the South Circular, and she correlated both of them. And every time there was a spike in air pollution, Ella ended up in hospital. And, yeah, so that's probably my only regret in life, actually, that we never... Because she desperately wanted to know why, why she was ill. Um, like you, she was an incredible football fan. You know, she used to play for Millwall. She played um, for Millwall? Yeah. Fuck's sake. <laughs> she sounded great and then you said that. Um, so wow. we've all got to have our own flaws. Um, <laughs> there, you, there you go, so I was laughing. So, you know, I, I used to sort of take her um, to football and I was laughing because I, I always have memories when people talk about her. I actually remember I took her to the para the Paralympics and the thing with asthma is you can't actually tell when someone's really ill and I used to carry her nebulizer behind her and she'll go to the disabled because you know the disabled they had their own kind of thing you could kind of go to and me and the twins used to kind of follow her and she used to get them and then people used to say to her um, you do know this is the this is for disabled people, and she'd like look at them and go. You, she goes, you can't see all disabilities, you know. Yeah. And she'd go into this kind of rant about lecturing people that some disabilities are hidden and you can't see it. And you think, oh, just hurry up and let's just. <laughs> but no, yeah, she but she was great, absolutely great. Uh, that's a that's an extraordinary example of it, though. Actually, that somebody saying you're you know you shouldn't be here, you're not disabled, and it's like. You know, this child who was clearly, you know, suffering so much. Oh, she was always lecturing people, come on. I mean... <laughs> 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 we used to be... The twins and I used to be behind and think, come on, Baba, just get on with it. I mean, you know, the moment someone said that, you thought, oh, here we go. We're now going to have another lecture, like, from her. I, come on, I, let's be I'm, honest. Uh. I'm, I'm with Ella in a TED Talk, oh. so I'm, I'm, I think she was doing... <laughs> As much for disability rights as you are now doing for clean air rights. Oh. But you told us backstage that you fought to, uh, to find out and it was declared. Uh, can you tell us about her death certificate? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously on, on the night she passed away, she had a massive cardiac arrest and she had an asthma attack. And that, that was initially on the death certificate. So although she died in February 2013, it wasn't until September 2014 before she had her first inquest. And, and the reason being was her case was so complicated, they had to find someone specifically with enough knowledge to deal with it. And the one thing that came out of that inquest was they said her triggers were to do with something in the air. And I, I remember, so that was September 2014. So February 2015, two years after she passed, passed away, I gave an interview in a local newspaper and basically said, you know, can anyone help me solve the mystery of my daughter's death? And that is actually still there now. And that's when, you know, I got all sorts of people writing to me. Some said it was dairy, some said this. And there was one guy who wrote to me. I, I, I have to be honest, I'd never known anything about air pollution, but I, I always remember his, his um, thing. He said to me, you need to have a look at the air pollution where it was on the night 
your daughter died. And at that point, I did think he was some crankpot. Obviously not. No, I did, because I didn't know any, anything about air pollution. But he actually was right, because on the night when she had her final attack, air pollution was then at the highest it had ever been. So he, he was right. So whoever that gentleman is, thank you. Mm. And you said that she, it was declared on, uh, by a judge on her birth certificate that that, that was... On, on, on her death certificate, on her, yeah. On her death certificate. <laughs> Not on, on her birth sorry, certificate. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I should take that again. She, she was born incredibly um, healthy. Um, yeah, I mean, the coroner's summary was, if it wasn't for the illegal levels of air pollution in the area where we live... Not only would she not have had asthma, but she wouldn't have died on that fatal night. How many people die globally every year from air pollution? Um, well, let's start off with the UK. So around 36,000 people die, and I will, I will come on to explain how that works. And globally, as I found out, looking at Ella's case, between 7 and 9 million people every year. Wow. And they die through, um, so more than malaria, more than, I mean, th the number is f phenomenal. But there's a really interesting fact for you. So every year they quote this number, and yet Ella remains the only person in the world to have air pollution on her death certificate. And up until that verdict, nobody had done it before either. So I always say to audiences, especially doctors, my question to them is, why, does, why do you think my daughter is the only person to have air pollution on her death certificate? And I'm sure different people will come to different conclusions about that. Well, presumably it's quite political. Oh, yes. Oh, and, yes. And so since she died and you found out the reason that she mm -hmm. died, you have founded the Ella Roberta Foundation. Correct. And you have worked tirelessly uh, to fight air pollution. Correct. What is the current state of play? Because you are an expert on this. What's the current state of play with air pollution? Is it worse than when Ella passed away? Or is it better? Have we, <clears throat> have we made any improvement? I think that would depend where you live. So every city, every town, air pollution is the first pandemic before COVID. And what that means is there's air pollution everywhere. So depending on where you live, and obviously the richer you are, you can buy a nice house in a lovely green area. And if you're poor, then you have to live near like main roads and stuff like that. So depending on where you live, has air pollution got better? Yes, it has. I'm not going to lie about that. But the pollutants that make us sick, they are they are still there. Hence, in London especially, um, every year between 8 and 12 children die from asthma. And the only time that didn't happen is during the first lockdown in COVID. As we speak, suddenly um, the temperature dipped this morning. I don't know whether people, obviously people realise it. So, yeah, that kind of makes me a little panicky. Because um, I, I live in a city that every year up to 12 children uh, die. And we've got a lot of asthmatics in London, actually. A quarter of a million children have mm. asthma. And um, when I say that, people look shocked. We have the worst asthma rate in in the whole of Europe, actually. So do it's, we? It's not, yes, That's yes, we the do. Air pollution in London. It is a contributory factor, a massive contributory factor. And I think Sadiq um, Khan was doing his um, best. Um, I know it's a bit political. Um, you Well, the the only the only way of dealing with air, air pollution is number one. We know what the sources are: um, emissions from cars wood burning, construction, and dust. So what he was trying to do is lower the emissions. And my plea is for, for people to stop um, burning, um, burning wood because that doesn't help as well. I thought in, in London you're not allowed to have a, a, a wood burning fire unless it's certain sort of wood, right? The, <laughs> the same way, <laughs> there's no such thing as clean diesel. There's no such thing as clean wood. Burning is burning. That's just going to end up being one big fat lie. I think they're just trying to appease certain section of the population. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's only very few people now who have wood-burning fires in London, and they are very rich. <laughs> Let's be honest. But is it, is it not like industry that would be doing it? Like... Who, well, rich people have fireplaces, don't they? That's that's. But but. But I suppose, like, the amount of fireplaces of wood-burning wouldn't be as much as, like... Wouldn't, would have, like, a tiny impact. Is it that, like, industry is burning wood for, like... 
No, the I think processes, I or think, is it more individuals? I think during COVID, um, the fact that um, PM two point five, which is the worst hair pollutant that affects human health, that didn't go down in London. And the reason why, because we know all the cars were off the road, mm. so the only thing that was out there was wood, wood burning. Oh. But it's very political when you say it. People get really upset with you. Really? They yeah, just wanna, wood burning. Um, people, just burn wanna, wood. people just want to carry on. You know, it's very carcinogenic, number so, one. So 5th of November, which is coming up. Uh-oh. It's, <laughs> that's sort of all the, the, the bonfires. We shouldn't do that. Well, we shouldn't do that. And there are other ways of doing it. I mean, and, you know. What are the other ways of doing it? I have mentioned that to Sadiq as well. You know, like New Year's Eve, try and find something else, you know, uh, to, to do rather than do all those huge bonfires. Oh, there's not other ways of doing bonfires. It's just there's other things to do. Well, you can do com- computer generated. Uh, 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 I mean, look at Delhi. Every time they, every time they have fireworks during a Diwali, kids then can't go to school for the next five days. Really? So, yeah. It, so, it, it, fireworks... And they get also scared of. But you see that then that, that sounds like I'm kind of ruining people's fun, doesn't yeah. it? But it's just that I care about people living a bit longer. So forgive me. Yeah. No, I understand that. I understand that. Fireworks are problematic for all sorts of reasons. Well, um, and also pets. You know, if you've got like a dog or whatever, I'm sure they don't yeah. like fireworks either. But the fifth of November, that whole period is is and New Year's Eve is all fi- is all uh, fire fire tastic. Well, wood burning, it's, it's, it's not just one day. I mean, I think what Frank Kelly, Frank Kelly is this amazing professor from Imperial. He basically said you shouldn't burn anything. He said, People really? Think, yeah, he said things should remain underground. You shouldn't really bring anything up. That that was his what advice. What about cremation? I, you'd have to speak to him him about that. <laughs> Could it? So she came me into all sorts of areas now. I, 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 I really wouldn't want to comment on that. Oh my Okay, goodness, all right. Very... So, okay, so... Um, so. Where is this going? No, I'm just, I'm just. No, I just didn't know this about burning. What you burning. have to remember is that both of us are very thick, um, <laughs> so it won't gas, be the most. I didn't say that. Question. Uh, gas fires are okay, right? No, I mean there are some. No, because that's what's going to happen eventually. Look, ultimately, what needs to happen is there needs to be a public health campaign, and the government need to release all this information and let people know. Uh, it really sounds as if people are just trying to, you know, people want to have fun, people want to do this, and, you know, there are people out there just... Basically, look, we, we now... I think when I was younger in school, one in nine people got cancer, and it's now one in two, and it's a real worry. So one of the cancers which is on the increase is lung cancer, and that's oh people in their 30s and 40s who actually don't smoke. So on a very serious note now, that's the sort of thing. I think... Is that from pollution? 30% of lung cancer cases are from air pollution. So oh there is 70%, God. which is genetic and smoking, but 30%. Similarly, 20% of strokes are down to air pollution, oh I'm my afraid. God. So is the worst thing cars, and then there's burning things. Yep. What else shouldn't... So we should be really looking to have what kind of cars, electric and diesel cars? Well, where you can, and this is where you get... I mean. I'm in a dilemma over this thing because really what needs to happen is if you want to stop people driving, then you need to make sure you've got good public service, uh, good public transport. And what I mean by that, it needs to be cheap, not. It really It needs to be safe, not. It needs to be clean, not. And it needs to be reliable. You need to give people an alternative to get out. There's no point in me coming here and saying to people, don't drive. Some people need some people need their cars, but you need to give people an alternative. Mm. Have you tried getting from here to Manchester? Yes. You know, try buying a ticket. Yes. Compared to driving, unbelievable. There you unbelievable. are. Unbelievable. The trains. I mean, you must know this being a comedian. You know that that your tra- when you travel around doing you know gigs. Yeah, it's absolutely outrageous. It's outrageous what train fares cost in this country. Yeah, and it's like they're sort of trying to catch you out or something. Um, and 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 I I think that sort of pricing where it's like on the day or or like a couple of days before where they just like hike it up. Yeah, it just doesn't yeah. sort it's of. It's like a it's more expensive fair. than a plane fare sometimes. To yeah, absolute, ab- absolutely, absolutely. To where to yeah, Nora. yeah. Um, you know, you know, and it, and it's cheaper than you can track, which is terrible, of course, for the environment. Yeah, I mean, when you travel, when you go outside of the UK, and especially the Scandinavian countries and other countries, you actually realise how far we are 
behind. So whilst Mr. Sunak was mushing, was pushing the date back, and some people were going, "Yay, Sweden are now bringing the date forward." And it of just, course they are. For, well, for... it's because. For petrol and diesel cars in Stockholm in 2025, you won't be able to have petrol and diesel there. It's just that they appear to care more about their citizens' health than we do. Yeah. Don't be surprised. I mean, should we all move to Stockholm? <laughs> we, should, um, we should try and make here more like Stockholm. Yeah, I think we should. And also, like, I'm pretty sure they're having a problem with the right wing over there as well. I don't think it's all fun and games. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I... Yeah, I I feel um I feel like I'm going in the realms of ranty, but um yeah I I don't know I I think we should certainly improve and um that's what I have to say on it really yeah <laughs> we should no, we should we should but how do we what do, how can we help your campaign oh yeah so currently um we've got. A, I actually went to the Houses of Lords. I still can't. I, I actually sometimes have to pinch myself that I managed to convince people in the Houses of Lords to pass Ella's law. And I managed to do it with the Conservatives, with, with the Liberals, with everybody. Then I thought, okay, it's now in the Houses of Commons. This is going to be easy. Mm -mm, not at all. It is currently sitting there doing nothing. Of course, the only person that can really pass it would be Mr. Sunak because he has a majority, but of course he's not going to do that. Do so, you have hope that if Keir Starmer gets in, that he will do it? I am going to put my hope in the British public because when I put out a petition about two weeks ago, within nine days, 10,000 people have signed it, and we now need an, another 90,000, and we're going to ask for a public debate. And the British public, a bit like they asked um, the attorney a general, to quash Ella's first inquest, I'm going to ask the British public again to demand that clean air be made a human right from the government. I just want the government to know that they don't control the agenda and that the British public control the agenda. So I just need to convince the British public to sign the petition and then we're going to demand it. So... I Where know, I am a pain in the arse, I am for no. the government, I well, really am. you say that, you know, Ella used to go on rants. I mean, <laughs> I can see where she got it from. Um, can you tell us how we can help with this petition? How we can Absolutely. Um, when you go on the UK government and parliament site, um, it, it has that little, um, it, it's got like a green label there with, with a parliament sign. Um, and it's called Heller's Law. I will send it to, or I'll get um, Sarah to send it to you so you can tweet it to people out there. Do you know what? Can I just say thank you? It's unbelievable that 10,000 people signed it in nine days. I can't believe it. No, no, I really can't. Oh, and the government need to respond to us, all of us, within 15 working days. So we will see. Yeah. But in the, in the meantime, um, I'm just going to ask people to carry on signing. We've got up until 14th of December, but we're not going to leave it that late because then they'll be telling us they're going home for Christmas. Yeah. So we need to get it over the line by the, by the end of November, really. I think they just shake their head and they say to me, how do you manage to convince the public to do these things? Well, because I'm really honest with the public. I tell them what's going on. I think you should you should stand as an MP. Oh no 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 no. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I have been blessed. I've got to say that um, I am a WHO ambassador, and I get to do this um, not just here, but I can take it all over the world. And I think people can see that politics is really broken, really. So I think I better stay on this side and put pressure on them, um, rather. Um, no, normally people who come here all say, "Oh, I don't." The only thing I might consider one day, one day in the future, um, maybe have something to do with London politics. But I think for now, I need to focus on the, those 7 million people because children are children everywhere. And the fact that ev every year, half a million children die from air pollution before the age of five, I think, I think I've got my work cut out. And I think of course, the British yeah. public will forgive me if I start trying to improve health Elsewhere. around the world yeah but if you ever did want to run for london mayor when sadiq's had enough we would all fully vote for you oh thank you that's were, you, were you head girl i was head of yeah head of six four of course you were there you go <laughs> head girl head girl head, takes one to know one 
takes one to no one. Can I just say as well, um, I think we're going to get that petition up to 100,000 very quickly because I'm going to send it to my mum. And once she, once, she, <laughs> once she puts it in the book club WhatsApp, that is going viral. <laughs> I, I love her already. <laughs> um, Ella's, can you just tell us a little bit about what Ella's Law is? What would Ella's Law do? Absolutely. Oh, Ella's Law, believe this or not, Ella's Law includes both indoor and outdoor air. And I'm absolutely outraged about mould. And we actually wrote this before Howab sadly died. I think I've known from my time as head of year, and Ella's friends are now at university in your second year, and some of the properties young people have to live in or people have to live in is absolutely appalling. And if Ella's law pass, councils and public authorities, they will be held responsible to actually do something. And also what Ella's law means is it will be our human right to breathe clean air. And what that means is no matter who gets into government, they will have to clean up the air because the coroner said unless the air is clean, that waiting list, by the way, is going to continue to rise. I think we're now at 7.75 million in the National Health Service. Yes, other things contribute to it, but if you think about air pollution, it actually impacts every organ in the body. So from dementia, miscarriages, stillbirth, cardiovascular, respiratory illnesses, every illness you can trace it back actually has a link with air pollution. So unless they clean up the air, you and I are going to continue to be impacted. And some people are more vulnerable, sadly, than others. Mm, God. Well, we really must get that petition out there. Everyone should Google uh, Ella's Law petition and uh, put it around on your socials, but also your WhatsApp group is a good thing. Um, I think when people are personally asked, mm. uh, and any influential people you know, if they're if you're personally asked, they will then pass it round. And you're right, mums are great at it. Like you know, yeah. just like can every, think about the networks that your people in your networks have, and see if you can spread it out and see how quickly we can get it to a hundred thousand. Because that's when the government is going to have to start listening. Oh yeah. yeah, you you will suddenly see the conversation will start changing again. Very much so. I think they are watching it to see what's what's going to happen. And they probably think, oh, she's not going to do it this time. Otherwise, you have to wait a, a whole year, and there is no guarantee that if a new government comes in, they're going to take this matter seriously. So we have to take this in our own hands and actually force them for a debate and demand. I don't think they really know what's coming. So, yeah. Mm. I don't <laughs> think they know what's coming either, Rosamond. And I... I'm very excited that it's you that's coming. Um, <laughs> um, that sounds like a threat. No, can I thank you? You, you know, I, I must thank the British public that they, 10 years ago, they didn't know us and they have continued to support me and especially my twins. They've actually grown up with all this going on. And it is so nice to sort of meet people in, in, in the streets. A, a lot of people just kind of just do that they just nod their heads or some people say thank you and it is great i mean this year for the 10th anniversary so many people came to the south bank to support and i still can't believe that this tiny little brattish girl at some point has managed to change history and people people absolutely adore her and as her mother it is an absolute great feeling so even days when i feel down it doesn't actually last because people are just so 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 nice and thank you to the british public again for all the support we'd love to get the guilty feminist audience behind you and uh, is there any way we can make donations to uh, the foundation? Yeah, we have a Just Giving page, but I'm more interested right now in the petition. Um, that means everything, because I think we need to change some laws. We, we can't wait. There are too many people in their 30s and 40s getting things like cancers, and that is my main focus. Yes, when you go on Ella's website or my Twitter feed, you can donate there, but it is the petition that is getting me out of bed right now. If you listen regularly, you know that whenever I tour Australia, um, I do lots of shows with Cal Wilson, and I usually get her to do the main, because we just had chemistry on stage that we just adored each other, and we adored working together, and she always made me better, she always made me funnier. And we all, I don't think I ever did a show in New Zealand without Cal, and she's early 50s, 14-year-old kid, picture of health, she was presenting Great Australian Bake Off, um, brilliant comedian, brilliant presenter, 
And she felt ill and was taken to hospital while presenting. And then um, four weeks later, she was dead. And it was lung cancer. Oh. And th- we didn't even we didn't know she had it. Like I got texted on the day by a mutual friend, and this was this last this was last week. And um, Cal's ill. Can, you, can I call you? And I was like, yeah. And I thought, oh, she's going to say, you know, she's got to have chemo and stuff. And she just said, you want to say goodbye? You have to say goodbye now. So I had to like talk to her on the phone, and she was the machine was beeping. I don't know if she could hear me or not, but it was so awful. And I was just like, and she's got a fourteen year old, and they God. It, they, she loved him and he loved her and he was such good, you know, they were such good fun together and I don't know how he's going to cope having a mum like Cal and then not having a mum at all, I just don't know because she was like the best mum in the world and you just go, what? Like, and I, I was thinking, how could she have lung cancer? She's such a healthy lifestyle, I couldn't work it out and I was like, maybe when she was young, you know, because we were in all those smoky clubs. Don't, don't forget, air pollution, the, the particulate matter, it is invisible. And people are breathing yeah. it in. Remember what I said to you? Some people are more susceptible than others. Do you think it's people, airports and stuff as people well? People are breathing, the thing, you know, tiny, tiny particles. I mean, Ella's body, we needed to look underneath a microscope to actually see it. You couldn't see it with the naked eye. But people are breathing it in every single day. Okay, if you s- sit on the tube from one end, let's just say you take the northern line, from one end to the other, when you get out, blow your nose and see what comes out then you, you know. And no, it's not scaring people. It's just being honest with people. And people need to demand more from government. Yes, individuals, we can do our bit. But ultimately, it's up to the government and authorities. And I'm really, really sorry for especially the, the young lad, you know, to go through that. Yeah. And that is why, see, that will spare me on hearing this story today. And I hear stories like that all the time, I managed to get the privilege of still going into hospital and seeing children on nebulizers. And that's what ultimately Mm. keeps me going. Because people go, how do you keep on going? It's when I hear stories like you've just told me. Mm. Yeah. And I don't know if I can... It really freaked me out. I was like, was it comedy clubs when, you know, before the smoking ban when she was young? I couldn't work out. How could Cal, of all people, have lung cancer? She very fit, healthy lifestyle. She didn't drink much. She, I never saw her smoke. And I just was like... I'm... Remember the MP, um, pardon me if I get it wrong, James Brokenshire. Yeah. He was 52. And I have spoken to his widow. And she, he also died from lung cancer. He also didn't smoke. And his, and his widower believes it was air pollution. So there are many people out there that, you know, people are are suffering. Do you know what? We're not going to save everyone, but if the air is cleaner, then not as many people will get ill. And I think that alone is worth campaigning for. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Given that we all stayed indoors and what the lengths we went to for COVID, and Mm -hmm. it sounds like it's, you know, it's killing, if it's killing 70 million people a year, well, put it, I mean, another boring sorry, fact. Sorry, not 70, 7 million, sorry. Another fact to know that um, people who lived in highly air polluted ha- areas ended up getting COVID more severely, and more people in high areas of air pollution died from COVID. Mm. So, yet again, you see, so air pollution is linked everywhere. But by the way, this isn't news to governments mm. everywhere. All government knows this, they read the same things I do. What it's about is fossil fuels and money. This is what this is ultimately about. This isn't this isn't a a secret. And deep down, people know people know that also. Mm. So we need we need to make it clear to them that they will lose votes if they don't act fast. Well, they need to make it clear to the prime minister who seemed to think that extending it by five years. And one of the things I said I must try and find out is by him extending it by five years, how many more people will become ill. Please don't think that these things are just, you know, a needle in a haystack. These are real people's lives and and real people. And I think we need to... I think he's got it wrong. I generally think that British people care more about their health and their children's health because I think in every classroom now, three or four children has asthma, which is appalling. Yeah. So I'm not scaremongering, otherwise... I would say to you, everyone has asthma, but no, but three is three too many. Mm. And once you have asthma, it is incurable. You've got it for the rest of your rest of your life. So it is definitely and we shouldn't allow politicians to bias off 
with, with but this is what this is about. Mm. This is about votes, by the way. Sorry to say, but it's ultimately about, it is not about my health, your health, everyone's health. It's about, if I do this, then you're going to vote for me, aren't you? Mm. So they're trying to buy to us, the, basically. The voting thing. Yeah. There you they're, are. Yeah, I was in Melbourne once. There was this big kind of storm of some sort and loads of people couldn't, I just suddenly couldn't breathe and they, the paramedics had to come and uh, they said, oh, we're, they took ages to come and I was like breathing very shallowly and I didn't have Ventolin or anything because I've only had asthma once before in my life and that was because of hay fever in, in uh, a very specific place and time. And they came, they said, people all over Melbourne can't breathe. Like they're, they're, And it was something to do with the storm, but I guess it whipped up in Melbourne, a lot of the pollution that was latent there and put it directly into our lungs. So this is clearly something that... Could I give you a bit of advice? Yeah. Always, even if you don't need it, just have a Ventolin on you in your bag. You never, ever know mm. when you need it because a lot more people get caught out by that and that's mm. how people die from asthma. I think I'd better. Yeah. I think I'd better. I think you better too. Yeah. Chloe, have you got any more questions before we wrap up? No, I think that everything was so clear so beautifully articulated thank you so much for sharing. thank you very much for thank, thank you, you for having so me so much for sharing um, you're doing incredible work everybody rosamunda do kissy deborah you have been listening to the guilty family with me deborah francis white guest co-host chloe pitts and our very special guest, Rosamund Adu, to see Deborah. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The Guilty Founders theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Sielinski from the Squash Lady Shop. Thanks to Rachel Craft, and Gina DC, Zainab Mohammed, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. <laughs> Crested or uncrested? <laughs> Uncrested. Is that right? Yeah. Very good. It. Thank you. Um, that Tom will have to cut that out because the Eden Ravenscroft stuff hasn't happened yet. It hasn't. It hasn't. This is the cold. We've gone through a time warp. Yeah. Yeah, because because the, the, if you listen to the podcast, Chloe, it always opens with this. I do. Have you ever listened to it? Yeah, of course I've listened to it. She's never listened to it. I've listened to it. She's only listened to the one she's been on. No, um, I've listened to ones with Alison Spittle on. She was on. <laughs> She's been on so many times. I'm just, I'm just saying names delighted. now. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. But she, she was... Was she a head girl? Like no, she... no, definitely. Alison's not a head girl. Jesus Christ, no. She's too... <laughs> she's too chilled out and lovely. <laughs> the Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.